Now you do. If that, if that subject reading is below a 0.005, we blank it. So you really shouldn't be seeing readings below a 0.005 on a data master. Okay? Now that leaves you with, you know, with, with your 0.01 or up to a 0.01. Well, those PBTs go to the hundred. Like Are you doing that on a, on a fuel cell? Yeah. <laughs> oh. I'm always arguing with us. Like, like, I think I'm the only guy that really knows all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm up there a couple of times. Oh, well. Uh, do they have requirements for calibrating those things? They do. I always get the law on them. But it's not a very... What they do in Michigan is like they have evidence that's required from the data master. And anything that can introduce that evidence. But then the PBTs fall under this different category if you're just using it as a preliminary sort of device from the top of the cloud. We're kind of calibrated or simulated the way you would a data master or, another, or any other such device that's used in a Certainly not something I'd want to try to support. Okay, to me, uh, fuel cells have always been a funny monkey in the industry. Uh, they don't tend to retain calibration all that well, although. Typically, when they go out of calibration, they don't go out to the high side, they go out to the low side. They become less sensitive, okay? But, you know, from your vantage point, that should be, it loses its accuracy. I mean, you don't really care whether it's going high or low. Your argument is it's losing accuracy, okay? But uh, fuel cell, there's a reason why fuel cells have not been read that readily accepted in evidential breath analysis, and it's simply because they don't do the job that infrared does. They're not as stable, and they don't retain calibration for long periods like infrared does. I, I wanted to ask you a question on the 2100 <clears throat> standard. Did they use both men and women to find this average? And is there an argument that women should maybe have their own average and be tested on their own machine? You can make that. I'm no, just they wondering how everybody. that would, they use everybody. I'm just wondering how that would skewer the, <coughs> the average everybody. possible use. Yes. It, it probably sure. would have changed it a little bit, yeah. Uh, you know, but I, I think in, in the big picture, what you, you know, and, and you can continue using that argument. That's a great argument in court. It's, you know, if you can make it, it's a great argument. <coughs> but the simple fact is, when you look at, at at all the work that's out there, you look at Mike Costello's work, and you know, I don't have a rub with Mike Costello. I read his stuff; it makes sense. Okay. Uh, I'm a little miffed that not miffed, but I'm, I'm a little taken aback that he would he would do so much testimony without ever having done the first test. Yet. Is he the one that says it should be 1,700? Uh, no, that was... Uh, La Bianca. Yeah, La Bianca. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that much about La Bianca. I have worked, and I've known Mike <coughs> Stalin for a lot of years. Uh, Mike has not done the first test. Well, regardless, okay, it's a good theory. It, it does make sense, all right? But, you know, even looking at that and, and granting that this, this theory can make sense, all right, it might be the case. <clears throat> what he's saying was present in every single test that's ever been done. And yet they still come in at 2300. So whatever it is that's, that he says is making the difference, it's probably already been taken into account. You know? You can change the... That's a legislative thing. That's, you know... But the scientists are readily going to admit that is not the greatest number in the world, but it's the best we got to work with. And if you're going to have some sort of number to work with, hey, that gives you 95% certainty, and that's all they care about. Well, John, when you, uh, a national patent, and I guess maybe it's, it's industry wide, uh, I know a question I always get from clients, uh, and it's something I've wondered, and I've thought maybe about much better, is. Can we come out there and say, is there a, like a, a range? I know I had Dr. Glenn at a blood test one time to testify that on a blood test result, there's going to always be a range, no matter what factors are up, 
pull everything, it's going to be about a .01 either way. That with all these factors, on the data master machine, is that something that's uh, out there, or is that are we just Let's look at that. Okay. When we come out with a number, I don't care what it is, .10, doesn't matter. That is the number that the instrument read. Okay, I don't know whether that relates real well to this or not, because what relates to this is going to be how good a sample you actually got. How close did you come to the air that's mixing with the, alve the, <coughs> the alveola and the outer arteries? That's, what, that's what's going to give you the highest reading. All I can tell you is what we measured. Now, I will guarantee from the factory that that measurement is correct, plus or minus 2%. Because when we calibrate it, we look for plus or minus 1%. If it can't do plus or minus 1%, it doesn't go out our door. When we get it into the, out into the, not the field, but when we get it into the customer's lab, we can guarantee that that customer is going to be able to do 20, plus or minus 2%. Now, why the difference? Because frankly, they're not as good as we are. Our techs do it every day, all day. All right? They understand the surroundings that have to be in place in order to get these things to do plus or minus 1%. All right? When it goes to the field, then the state's accuracy specification takes over. And that's, the plus, that's where you see the plus or minus 5%. And why do they do a plus or minus 5%? Because if we got techni technicians down there that are good, you really want to have the cops trying to duplicate what our technicians are doing. Man, these guys aren't going to be capable of that. They got thumbs about four inches wide for them. <laughs> you know, there's no way they're going to they're going to do that. So if they can hit plus or minus 5%, they're doing pretty good. Okay. Any other questions on that? <coughs> Change the topic a little bit. What's the, the holdup on the rollout of the EMT edition? What's the state of this issue with that? They don't have people. They really do not have people. I mean, they just search for some staff is absurd. DMT? Yeah. yeah. It, uh, Perry would have liked to have had these things in the field two years ago. They basically, basically have been setting, well, he's tried to get the training manual together, you know. <coughs> Because he, he had to do everything. He's training them. He's doing the manual. Now, he does have our people do the installations once he, you know, once he decides to go for it. Basically, it's a personnel issue. Can you talk a little bit about the differences between the, going from the data master to the DMT? Sure. Is that still going to have the same set a day and 120 day test requirements and things like that? Sure. Yeah. No, I don't. I'm going to let Bill <coughs> speak to the. Te state testing requirements. I'll, I'll give it to you as I understand it, but I'm not sure how, what I understand is really what they're doing. Mm -hmm. my, my question was, with the DMC, is that a machine that's designed to be installed as a vehicle, or is that simply just in the, uh, so take the place of the first data master? Yeah, it's an upgrade for data master. Let me just go over the differences in it. Um, first of all, the original data master, you had somebody talking about software a little earlier, okay? The original data masters, <clears throat> aside from the way this thing looks in the box, okay, forget about that. Let's talk about the, the inner workings because that's what's that's what's important. You had software in the data master. The software in the data master was written in essentially assembly code, which is a very high-level form of software that is used to drive instruments, okay? It's used to drive instruments like these testing instruments uh, that are no longer what we call analog instruments. They're operating in a digital world now, okay? <coughs> that computer language we developed, and it basically had to do everything because it was resident in in our system, our design, okay, had no connections with the outside world. The DMT uses a totally different technique when it comes to 
<coughs> software and it is totally new software. It's the same algorithms, okay? In other words, two plus two is still two. And the software, it wasn't the old software, it's still the new software. But the DMT works on a platform of Windows. It's a Windows operating system. It's called Windows CE, which is sort of short for industrial version. But obviously there's not a lot of the frills that you have in what you'd have in your computer. Okay, if it's a if it's a Microsoft operating system you've got. That's a huge difference because now our software is resident in this Windows overall operating system. Okay? <coughs> It's also totally unique in its organization. Whereas the Data Master software was essentially a, a long string of, of about 50,000 lines of code that was virtually unmanageable when you had to go in and try to make changes or whatever, all right? We've been able to take the software, since it's now residing on a platform of Windows, and we've been able to separate that. So now we've got a we've got a, a, a separate piece of software that's that's driving the printers. So when the DMT is ready to print the evidence ticket, it goes over to the printer and says, "Hey, print this," and, and the printer module takes over and handles all that. When it's done, it goes back and turns control back over to the Windows system. Okay, everything moves in and out that way. It's much much easier to manage and control. We talked about optical filters. We're using the same optical filters in the DMT which are used in the data master. Source lamp is the same source lamp. Sample chamber is the same sample chamber, but it's shorter, okay? Uh, it's shorter by about three inches, roughly. Okay, still makes the three passes, but it's short. Why could we shorten it? We could shorten it because some of the length of the sample chamber that we're using in the data master, the additional length was necessary to overcome the precision of the way that we could place the filters into the optical path. Okay, we were using solenoids that actually would, they were, they were, they were called a, a rotary solenoid, it would actually take the filter and do this with it and move it into the optical path. When they were done with it, it'd rotate it back up. There's only so much precision when you're working this way, okay? This thing could move around slightly. And if that position is slightly different, the reading's gonna be slightly different. Okay, so we had the longer sample or longer sample chamber so that we had more precision to start with so that this variation wasn't making that much of a difference, all right? Well, the, the way the filters are now put into the system is different. We're using what's called a filter wheel. <clears throat> we're not spinning it, but we're rotating it. And we rotate it to the point where the right filter comes into view that we want in front of it. And then we drop a placement pin into the wheel itself. And it nails the position of this wheel to within about three thousandths of an inch. All right, and that becomes virtually identical placement every single time, all right? <coughs> so, so we've been able to do some different things here. But same filters, all right, same source lamp, same detector, um, which is basically the entire analytical bank. Right? The algorithms that handle the calculations for ethanol and interference are identical, even though they're written in a written in a different software, but they're still identical. Okay. Um, the algorithm that handles invalid sample 
has been expanded slightly. Okay. Uh, we've added another condition to it, which I think is perfectly useless. <coughs> but the in industry does useless things now and then. That condition that we've added is uh, that any that the ending reading not be more than 5% less than the highest reading seen during the entire sample. Okay? And the reason for that is, is when, <clears throat> when the breath goes up and it does this, we call this kind of a plateau. Although it never really stops rising, generally. You do occasionally see where it stops rising in some people. Okay, and it really shouldn't. And it's like Bill stated earlier, you know, un unless you're gonna tape the breath tube in this person's mouth and jump on his chest, you're not gonna get the last bit of air out of there. And the whole theory that we're based on here is that <coughs> the air that we're seeing is very close to deep lung air, or at least tidal air, which is what Bill was talking about, okay? So the better the sample, the higher the reading. Well, if you're moving towards that sample, then it only makes sense that the reading is going to keep rising, although very slow. But there's a finite amount of air that you can, you can expel to. All right? Is there a... Is there a way you can get an advanced sample <coughs> besides the person trying to fool the machine? Is there a way you can get a valid sample? Like, uh, you get an invalid sample if someone's like maybe not blowing all their air out. Oh, invalid. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, we should, we should probably talk about that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> what we're looking for is for this thing to slow down <coughs> to I think a rate of increase of not greater than 2% per second, something real close to that, right? Once it slows down to that point, and the person stops blowing, okay, then you'll get a sample, provided you've also satisfied the minimum requirements early on, which if you get up to that point, you've satisfied the minimum requirements. Invalid sample is triggered when, as this reading is going up, you have a lot of individual readings, okay? The computer, as this thing is moving up, is watching these and it's actually averaging every two of these. Average, 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 average. Okay. It compares the current average with the last average. No two of these averages should be going down consecutively. If they do, it's going to trigger an invalid sample. Okay. Now, how can you trigger an invalid sample by not cooperating? It's easy. You huff and you puff. Okay. If you huff and you puff in the instrument. <coughs> What happens is, it looks like this. Okay, now, the reason why it looks like that is because this is a rising reading. Person stops, takes a second breath. All right? <clears throat> as soon as they do that, air of a lower ethanol concentration because he's replaced the air in his in his bronchi and, and lungs with some fresh air, okay? A lower alcohol concentration is going to be seen when he starts to blow again. The reading starts out down here again, comes back up, okay? What happens if the person burps while they're blowing? It's an open argument for you. 
I mean, yeah, we can discuss the physics of it all day long. Uh, my own feeling is that it is possible, all right? If you don't have a good waiting period, if you have a person who expels air very slowly, all right? And is it just the right point in eliminating that alcohol from their stomach? It's possible, okay? But now, you know, keep in mind, and, and, and for your vocabulary, don't use the term, well, my client burped up raw alcohol. Because if you have somebody opposing you who knows what they're talking about, they're going to nail you. Raw alcohol is well beyond the range of the instrument. You will never see an invalid sample. If that instrument sees raw alcohol, you're going to see a detector overflow. Because we're designed to look at alcohol at approximately a 2100 to 1 ratio. Raw alcohol is going to have a hell of a high ratio of water. All right? It's not going to get through there. Right? But, you know, I say, you don't need to say that. But if you got somebody opposing you who knows what you're talking about, that's what they're going to, they're going to bring up. But that's, so, a, that's what the skew of that line is there. Oh. You're not going to get read okay. with raw alcohol. So, so just to, to be clear, when we have an upward spike like that, it's not going to say down the samples and say detect overflow and ticket. If yeah, if you what happens is if you get oh just never said never yeah, mentioned. If you actually get raw alcohol or an alcohol of a of a the, the, the range of the instrument is zero to point six. Okay? When you get an alcohol concentration beyond a point six <coughs> you've exceeded the range of the A to D converter. The instrument can't process it. There's nothing it can do except say detector overflow. Because to it, to the instrument, it looks like you've just dumped a whole bunch of crap in the sample chamber. That's what it looks like. Okay? Aside from the uh, the imbalanced samples, when you have you explain a little bit about the uh, you know, when you have two tests as Michigan allows for the second to validate the first and it's outside the allowable variance range yeah. or the fact that there's a variance range that changes as the alcohol levels go up. Well, yeah, I mean, you've got a couple of things that are involved there. Uh, I mean, I've always found it fairly found it fairly surprising that we get as good a correlation as we do between one and two meetings. I mean, so we're out to the third digits, and there are times when I see these readings that are the same, all three digits. And to me, that's astounding, okay? Because we don't pad these numbers. I mean, the number you see is the number you get. <clears throat> Why wouldn't they be the same? Number one, we have certain parameters that we work with. The slowing down, remember I said this averages? We need to slow down to no, no more than 0 0.00 two per second rate of increase, okay? <coughs> there's, a, there's a range there. Is the machine waiting until that slope levels off before it spits out a number, or is it, you know, it's... It's doing it in real time. These calculations are going on as the person is blowing. When does it say, okay, this is, I like this... Well, level. that's your, that's your, when, when you, when you get to the point where this reading is stable. The rate of increase is no greater than 0.002, and the person stops blowing. It's going to accept the sample. Okay. Okay. Answer your question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, oh, zero to 0.6. It was above a 0.6. This thing here is going to look like this, and it's just not. It's not going to take it. Okay. <clears throat> but. Your burp business? You can make the argument. Will it throw yes. off the machine? Pardon? Will you be able to reuse the machine right afterwards? What? If, <laughs> if you can convince everybody that that the conditions were perfect. And that's really what you've got to be able to do. Okay? You're creating a doubt. This is your job. Alright? We, we realize that. How possible is it that a burp we've never been able to get it through? Okay. Now that's not the same as saying it can't be done. All we're saying, all I'm saying is that 
we try to do it in the lab, we can't get it through. Right? But we do it using the instrument according to Hoyle. 20 minute waiting period, do it as we, you know, as we recommend that it be operated. But we're not, we're not saying it can't happen. Do you pay people to drink the testing machine? Oh yeah. And, or we have people that, you know, rent them to do it. Sure. Are you, you know, have to. It's the way you can test them sometimes. I need a jab like this company. You said you were going to tell us how to fool the data master on uh, mouth alcohol. Oh, mouth alcohol, oh, yeah. <coughs> That's pretty easy, actually. Um, <laughs> mouth alcohol is, is, you're going to see this condition. And this is a status condition. It's not an error condition. You're talking about the invalid sample. Okay, this is a status. It's not an error. Um, anytime... This reading essentially goes down rather than plateaus. It's going to trigger a mouth alcohol condition. Okay? The theory is, in breath alcohol testing, is that the reading should rise. And if there are no other issues, it should never fall. There's no reason why it should ever go down. It should rise to the point where it stabilizes, and that's it. Okay, you'll have a test result. If, in fact, that reading goes down, and we're going to trigger a, an invalid sample, okay, what would make the reading go down? <coughs> the traditional accepted message for why you would have mouth alcohol is that what would happen if, say, a, a wet bird brought raw alcohol up, alcohol caught under the dentures, all the places that it's supposed to come from, okay? If there's mouth alcohol present, then what happens when you blow is the reading goes up fast, and then as this alcohol in the mouth is dissipated, reading starts downhill, that triggers, and that should trigger, the invalid sample. Does it work? Yeah, it works. Does it work perfectly? Hell no. Okay. Why doesn't it work perfectly? Okay. If you have, and this works best if you have an underlying alcohol value. In other words, you know, you're going to, Somebody who hasn't been drinking can't really do this and, and fool the instrument with any degree of success. They may, but if they if they do, it's going to be a real quizzing. But if you've got an underlying alcohol down, okay, if you got a person that's an 05, 08, something like this, okay, they stand a real good chance of fooling the instrument when it comes to mouth alcohol. And the reason being is that it takes from the time you take a drink, it takes up to 10 minutes for that alcohol to fully dissipate from the mouth area. Now, in some cases, it might be a little less. In a very few cases, it's going to be a, a little bit more than that. Okay? <clears throat> so, what can happen instead of this, where it comes up and goes down, since you've got an underlying alcohol value there, all right, the person starts blowing, and without even having the mouth alcohol, you got this rise. Got alcohol present. The alcohol that's in the mouth is being then disseminated into the air that already contains alcohol that's coming from the lungs. It becomes additive. And since there's not very much in the mouth, and we're assuming you've waited two or three minutes after taking that swig, so that you're not blasting the thing with you know full raw alcohol, all right? The dissipation rate of the alcohol in the mouth 
is going to be slow enough that it becomes additive to the underlying alcohol reading. And if you do it right, you can actually take a person who is 05, 06, 07, and pull that reading up to 0 0.12, 0 0.2, okay? Now, but the key is here, you don't observe the waiting period, okay? Which immediately means you're not using the instrument like you're supposed to, okay? And that's all we're going to say to it is that, hey, you know, if you use the instrument like you're supposed to, you follow the rules. Mouth alcohol is not going to be a problem. As an additional precaution, we put that downward calculation in the slope so that if it's there, maybe we'll catch it. <coughs> but that is no way guaranteed. The data master will pick up 85, 90% of, of the mouth alcohols. It does a pretty good job compared to everybody else. Some of the instruments that are out there are going to do as little as 50%. And the reason goes back to the speed of the operating system. Remember I said 500 and some hertz? We can do a lot of crap that is really neat in the computer and digitally when we're running that fast. But if you've got a system that's only running at 2 or 4 hertz, you're really limited as to what you can look at. You just don't have the operating speed to crunch those numbers. It's just not there. <coughs> Let's talk a little bit about... Sir? You said that mouth uh, alcohol can be masked by... Uh, data that's out there on GERDs is the, the work that Wayne Jones did in Sweden a number of years ago. And Wayne Jones didn't do it. Some other guy did it and Wayne Jones signed on to it as a peer reviewer, I think. They took 10 people, known GERDs, uh, they went in and, and checked and said, yeah, yeah, you really have GERDs, put them through this drinking stuff, okay, and they weren't able <coughs> to produce any problem, problems, okay? But, the last paragraph, I think, of that study simply says the, the possibility of GERDs, of a GERDs condition contributing to a reading is highly unlikely. He never said it's not possible, okay? Okay, then Wayne being the master of personalities that he is. And Wayne Jones and I are friends. We go back a long way. Um, he promised me a PhD and he never delivered, so I don't have a lot of <laughs> So Wayne gets down to Georgia here about three or four years ago and he's making a, a presentation to uh, one of uh, Bubba Head's conferences <coughs> down there, okay? And he talks about this study, and he backs off even a little bit more on it, right? And instead of saying it's highly unlikely, he says, well, it might even be possible. Okay. It's a burp argument, and is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. Is it likely? Depends on what expert you're going to get to testify. Okay? A burp is a burp is a burp. If I'm not mistaken, Jones... And this is a letter in response to some article? You know, he's responded on that a couple of different times. Yeah. I'm simply going on what he said down at Bubba's thing. Yeah, no, no, no. What I was going to say, though, was that going back to the breath blood correlation 500 to 1, yeah. he suggested, and I could be wrong on this, I, I, I read too many things recently, that uh, this might go a long ways towards explaining some of those really skewed numbers from back in the day, yeah. that they weren't aware of this as a problem, and so they weren't guarding against it, and don't we have a possible explanation? 
So, but yeah, it, it was very possible. I mean, you know, it, it, it could have been contribution from GERDs to any of those outliers. It could have been technology that they were using. It could have been they just plain screwed up and taken their sample. You don't know. But, but the bottom line of that whole 2300 to 1 thing is, you know, is that all the major studies over the years have just consistently come up with that same number. There's always outliers. Maybe there'll always be outliers. In recent years, there's fewer and fewer outliers, which does sort of want to make want to make you think that well, maybe it had something to do with the, the way they were doing it back then. You know, it's just more prone to it. I don't know. It's an argument you need to be making. Sir? My question is, I was a little bit of lung physiology as it pertains to that. When we breathe, we only use about a third of our lungs normally. In other words. If we really wanted to, when we inhale, we can inhale a lot more, like holding your breath and going to where you take a deep breath. Same thing when we exhale. We don't exhale all the way, we can exhale a lot more. We're leaving about a third residual volume. Okay, so we're using the middle third. So what happens if, instead of doing that, before I take the breathalyzer and blow into your machine, I exhale all the way as much as I can to expel everything, let's say that 10% thing, and the big, clean air breath, do that again, exhale out. You don't have to really? Well, if I do it just once or twice, is that going to, does the alcohol move fast enough across the lungs that it's not going to make any difference? It, it could marginally lower the reading, yeah. Have you ever tested that? Yeah, I tried it personally, yeah. Did and it I, make I any think difference? it did. I don't know. It looked like it did, but okay. But it was not significant. You know, it's the same way if you hold your breath and blow, it has a tendency to raise the reading slightly. There's, you know, we never said this is a horribly exact science. It's not. Not by any means. I got a question. <clears throat> this is going back to the difference between the BMP and the Adenos. Um, does it deal with the technical refusal issue? I think under the old one, you, the officer needs to write on the ticket whether or not it's uh, 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 error by the machine or refusal to take the test. You know what? This is an area you want to keep your eye on. Uh, this is an area that cops get really, really lax on. Right. All right? <clears throat> and if, if you guys will give me... Uh, if, if Bill or somebody will give me your email address, I'll send you some stuff on, on this later. But when the instrument comes out and says invalid sample, okay, and the fact that that instrument gave you an invalid sample does not necessarily, and I do say not, indicate that there's grounds for a refusal. An invalid sample is an invalid sample. The only time that you should see an invalid sample on an evidence ticket and be confronted with a refusal is when the officer's observation can corroborate that this person was intentionally providing discontinuous blow patterns. He's huffing, he's puffing. Okay? The design intent of the data master and the DMT, DMT is that within reason, you provide a continuous sample. When you give that instrument a discontinuous sample, our position is the outcome of the test is going to be unpredictable. Unpredictable if the officers testimony corroborates that there was intentional discontinuous blowing could be grounds for a refusal. If all that happens is you see a refusal written on there, but the person blew and the test was terminated with an invalid sample, that is not grounds for a refusal unless the officer can testify that the person was intentionally not cooperating. Yes. John, uh, what about a technical refusal where the result actually prints out refused, but the officer says that in his opinion, the person was making an honest and sincere effort to provide a breath sample? 
is that actually a refusal or is that some sort of the that's right. You're, you're asking me a legal question. <laughs> you're, uh, what happens is you can get a situation where the person, it looks like they're providing a good sample, they're fooling the officer. In fact, they're not meeting the instrument requirements. And, and what happens is the, the test will then be, 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 be the two minute window allowable for a test. You'll reach the end of that two minute window. The instrument's going to say to the officer, subject refused question mark. The officer's response has got to be either a yes or a no. Okay? If he says yes, it's going to print subject refused. If he says no, it's going to print, I think, incomplete test. Which means that then you can cycle it for another, another test. Okay? So what you're thinking, the least the last manual, and I'm not ready to run the hands. <coughs> the last manual said, in order for this machine to get a valid sample, for lack of a better word, <coughs> you have to have, I forgot what the liters was, it's two liters per minute per blah, 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 right? So, all you're saying is, because we fight this in, in implied consent hearings all the time, right? Because I'm interested in your later in your statement today, which says, Refusal is only if the officer can show intention. Yeah. Now, I've seen, you know, where officers are written down, the person is hyperventilating. But see, what they're not doing is saying, I mean, they, they refuse to accept our clients as, some of them actually have lung conditions. You're coughing right now. I'm not sure you could give. Okay. It's surprisingly easy to give, give a breath test. Okay. Uh, despite what you know, what issues you want to attach to, I've used these things for 20 some years. It's surprisingly easy. Once we got by the, the old intoxilizers with the three-inch pressure switch that it took a, a damn elephant to, to activate. Okay, we're using uh, thermistor on the big master. We're using a thermistor which is extremely sensitive. It can tell if you're blowing or not. On the DMT, we're actually using a uh, what they call a mass flow sensor, um, which is kind of like having two thermistors because you can not only establish that you're blowing and there's flow going into the instrument, it can establish that you're sucking backwards too. So you know, so that's kind of nice in determining your cooperation level at that time. Follow through. You know, in this police station is that we are able to get the booking data. You know, it, and, and I appreciate it because the machine, the improvement now is the black metal, the flow mesh, right? Or the it's flow rate. Flow sensor. The flow sensor. Okay. But, but if somebody is hyperventilating out of fear, for lack of a better word, it's, you're going to get that inhale blowback at the same time, right? Yeah, we can only be so good understand. at doing this. A lot of it's going to depend on the officer's observation. There's going to be no substitute for that. There are always going to be questions. <coughs> we can tell you certain things. We can tell you if he, if he managed to get to the threshold level to where the instrument was realizing that he, in fact, was blowing. Okay, we can measure the upward slope. You know, we can tell you if he was trying to suck back. Uh, but we have seen instances, even with the DMT, where these people, and I've seen the charts, man, they've got it right at the super threshold. And it just... It's just sitting there and it's moving like this. And according to the officer, they look like they were blowing quick. They weren't blowing. One last know. question. With the flow um, regulator, the flow, it's a flow sensor. Flow sensor. I can't, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. I have if, if the client is unable to give us a, 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 a adequate sample, you're still saying it's going to cycle out to the two minutes, or will it stop because it's not even, it's not getting there? And At the end of two minutes, it's always going to be something. Two minutes. Okay. Well, you've also got the automatic refusal, five inconsistent tests. Yeah, Michigan, I think has that five. And that was specific yeah. to Michigan, though. Five pro that was programmed that way. Yes, I can't say that Michigan's the only people who did that. Michigan's the only people <laughs> I remember that took the Okay. okay. There may have been others. Yeah. But yeah, they've got five attempts and, and you're and you're out. And those five attempts though can happen very quickly. 
Yeah. Okay. Fred, he, that he's so lower than Fred Fredfold, and it moves over and above my time. And that's an automatic. It doesn't offer the officer. That's what I'm talking yeah. about. I'm sorry. When the officer comes in and says, yeah, the guy was blowing, but the machine said refuse, so I said, okay, I don't know. Well, at that point, I mean, I'm going to tell you this, but you don't know, tell the officer you can report this. At that point, the person is blowing so, so slowly as to possibly constitute a refusal at any point because he's screwing around with it. That's the only way he's going to make you do that. Is you know, that's why, this is the entire reason I saw that video camera, John, is I wanted you to say something better than that. <laughs> <laughs> so does that, does, does the machine record five attempts to blow? Or, uh, you know, if you're asking me what the database is set up to do, you can't, I don't really know. Yeah, the, the, normally it does. Because I've had clients tell me, well, I blew in that thing five no, times. Not the database. The data master can't tell you did this one. Oh, okay. The DMT can. All right. Well, let's talk about the data master because that's what we're still using. Not no. necessarily. No, no. Lansing no. and Livingston County no. are DMT. Well, you've got to look at it. It's more DMT than you got. Yeah, you want to. Well, not where I'm at. Where are you? Yeah. yeah. I mean, your, your, your officer's uh, uh, you know, collaboration needs to be. Yeah, you're talking Okay, so here's my question. People tell me I blew five times. And they have one evidence ticket with two samples, and the evidence ticket records the instrument number that the test was performed on, but it doesn't record any log of the number of, of, of times. So if I want to look and say, well, well where are these other um, evidence tickets from well, prior blows, look, and wanted, they just tell me, well, I don't know what they're calling that. an attempt. I think what they're calling an attempt is is the fact that the person blows and then stops, but didn't complete the test. We're talking about a situation here, and I think we're clear on this. The five after five attempts, it's not five two-minute periods. It's five times you blew and then stop, blew and stop, blew and stop, blew and stop, blew and stop. You're out. It's like five, you know. And I suspect there's times where. You know, the officers are just initiating the test because, I mean, let's face it, they're trying to get the test out of the drum. So that wouldn't necessarily be a, a point where they're, say, destroying a previous evidence ticket that had bad information for them until they get a good one where they blow a high enough number. Now, I can't make a comment. I, I have no idea. <laughs> I've seen strange things happen. I, you know, that's what you guys are around for. <laughs> Well, John has a related question. Uh, you said you could look at the data yeah. and see exactly what they did on the DMT. Can we get that data? I don't think they're not set up to see it. Not set up to see it. But how would you see it? You'd have to go in internally and. Uh, no, I don't think they're even saving it. They're not even scoring. Okay. I don't think it's not even possible for us to do that. The machine has the capacity to do that. It has uh, the the machine has decided not to. Well, right. And the whole reason was that when, uh, uh, when Perry did this, he didn't have any help. He said, how the hell am I going to, personnel-wise, I can't do this. And he said, bare bones, no modem, no data storage, no nothing. That's what we're going to do. Essentially, it's just like the big muscle. It's a matter of the prosecution not have Yes, yeah, less for you guys to look at. Yeah, right, yes. But they could put it into a server or something, right? Put yeah. it in all of that and go into the server. Sure, but they need people. You know, that doesn't operate without people. Unless they're not, you just don't have people to work with. Does your company make other electronic systems that look at besides the other ones? We make a gas analyzer uh, that's used ultimately by Samsung and Intel. Um, it's used in the. Uh, it, Process control and manufacturer license substation that we're going to send to. Yeah. yeah. So we've been doing different areas of this for a while. John, I don't want to switch subjects. I know I'm, I'm very clear now how the machine works. And I've gone to other seminars where it was not really made to, you know, to at least to me how the machine works. Uh, but one thing you have talked about is, uh, right, what in its actual operation, you know, you've got somebody there that's blowing into this tube. I'm always getting on the cops up, uh, checking the, the little thing that I blow into. Uh, I put 
assume the machines like purge that, that air chamber, the chamber is purged after every test. Oh, yeah. Um, is there, if you have somebody and they have something in their mouth, whatever, uh, is there a chance that they can blow through the tube and then something may get stuck in the chamber or maybe something gets stuck in the screen and affect the test? And the other reason I ask, I'm always looking for outside, outside things that can alter that, that we presume is 100% accurate. Things that come into it as external factors. This is why any time you have a refusal, you'll want to check the records, the maintenance records on that, on that unit. And, and the reason being, <coughs> is that, and I've seen many times over the years where the officers will peel the plastic off the mouthpiece, not realize that a piece of the plastic is ripped and is actually over the front of the mouthpiece. They put that, that end of the mouthpiece into the death tube. Person blows, that piece of plastic goes right down over the thermistor, and all of a sudden the instrument can't tell if there's flow. What about if, because we have moisture in our breath, and I've always thought about essentially what the answer was, uh, as our air goes into the chamber, does that moisture affect the, the mirrors no. or the chamber, or even over time, no, or no, somebody has like a spit while they're the, moving uh, or anything like that? The instrument is heated, or the, uh, the same chamber is heated. To about 50 degrees centigrade to then condensate. So that is not that, that is never really John, can you help me? We'll, we'll run through a, sure, a test ahead. or something. Yeah. And this is this is one of the breath mouthpieces. You'll see these mouthpieces come in different sizes. There's some that are round. There's some that have a fancy little ball inside. This is uh, one of the versions. But Jim, what, what he's talking about with this plastic here, you see this is nice sure. and yeah, yeah, this is And you tear this thing open here. See how I'm stretching that plastic over there? Stretching, stretching, you know. Everybody see I'm stretching over the hole, over the hole, over the hole. And if I do this just wrong, and if you do hundreds of these, sooner or later you're going to get one that's stuck, okay? Because you open it up and the plastic got stuck in there. Now they can go into the tube, or it can remain over the exterior where the person's trying to blow. And they're sitting there and they're like, oh, sir, I'm blowing as hard as I can. I just don't, well, they really are, and there's nothing happening because there's a piece of plastic stuck in there. I had a case one time where the fella blew, and uh, you know how you get that steady tone as you're blowing? The officer said, okay, you can stop blowing now. And he said, oh, man. And he stopped blowing, and he stepped back, and it just kept beeping. It was still accepting the breast sample. And both the client and the officer sat there, and they looked at it, and they went, huh. Huh. And it never stopped until finally the officer shut it off and waited a couple minutes and turned it back on and they did a breath test. What had happened was is a little bit of spit had gotten all the way down that tube. The tube is heated and you're going to come on up here and feel it here later on so you can actually get this kind of hands on. But a piece of spit went all the way down and it got stuck on that thermistor. Thermistor is nothing more than a fancy little heat plate, a little coil, a little piece of metal there. And just like a cup of coffee you're blowing on. You blow on coffee, it cools down. Well, that thermistor will cool down too. When it cools down, it wants to heat back up. So it's going to increase the voltage. That's how it knows you're blowing. It's through that voltage. That's why I said earlier today that it's a fancy voltage regulator. It's looking at all these different voltages and measuring everything everywhere. So it knows you're blowing. But when this piece of spit got down there into a little coil, it was being cooled, even though the person wasn't blowing. And so because it was being cooled, it wanted to heat up, <coughs> voltage going in, it says the person's still blowing. Officer shut the machine down. That coil is hot. The coil dried up the spit. When he turned it back on, the spit was all dried, and they were able to do it again. And so it's so because I know a lot of the times we can't an expert are trying to mm -hmm. just use yep. it. I want the plant better for the article should read to, to win your trial. Which just talk about an alcohol spike. Jurors like the alcohol, a bolus dose of alcohol. That's another fancy one that jurors that. just love. That. Bolus dose. What does bolus dose mean, actually? I have no, oh, bolus. That's a, that's a, a measurement. Yep. A scientific measurement. Don't ask me what it relates to because I don't know. But a bolus I've dose. I've seen it used. Yeah, bolus. Yeah. Bolus. That's what yeah. that is. Uh huh. And now, uh, this uh, simulator. You want to run the simulator? No, oh, you can do whatever you want there. Go ahead. No, you run the simulator. Uh, May I make I, a suggestion? I don't know how to sing anymore. You're better at it either. Than I, well, I don't know the buttons to press. Uh, I gotta go through the manual if I'm gonna run a single. Can I make a, can I make a suggestion? Yeah. yeah. Bathroom break? Oh uh, well, I'm gonna wanna let John go here. Oh, okay. Um, 
Do you want to get going? No, I don't want to go too much further, you know, because I'm going to. I can. You, I can take a lot of stuff. Okay, okay, you've got a lot of stuff to. Okay. Anybody else want to? Let's take a. I just have a quick question. Yeah. Quick question. I had a. I had a, a, an officer at trial about a year ago testified that um, I don't know if you've ever seen the Michigan sheets uh, for the simulations when you're doing the simulation, how it's supposed to be 0.084 down to 0.076, right. and what he had said was the reason why there's that range like a 0.08 or 0.9, whatever that is, is uh, because sometimes there's human error when they're doing the wet gas thing in the simulator. I just came out of nowhere. This is just on the traffic path, and I thought it was He's talking BS. about the tolerance on the, the, the reading of, against the target value of the simulator. Yeah, because you know, it's supposed yeah. to be 0.08, but if it's a 0.08 yeah, or I mean, or you, know, you got human error, you got accuracy errors, you got simulator problems, you got all sorts of issues that so that's why you've got a tolerance. Uh, you know, that's what tolerances are for. So. John, I, I, I'm just becoming familiar with the DMT. I'm trying to figure out the allowable variance, the target score of 5%, and the correction factor. Well, are, you talking about are you going to talk about Are you going to talk about uh, I can do a real, just a real short thing on dry gas. Just kind of put that in for a second. And that's the DMT. Yeah. Yeah, but the dry gas simply takes the place of a simulator. That's all it does, right? It is not utilized in the calibration of the instrument. A failed dry gas test does not affect the calibration of the instrument, okay? Uh, barometric pressure compensation does not affect the reading of the instrument, all right? And the reason why you have barometric pressure compensation is because according to the ideal gas law, the molecules of ethanol are going to be spread at, a, at any given concentration, are going to be spread to X distance at any given atmosphere. Well, when they bottle the dry gas, they mix it and they bottle it so that the target value of the dry gas is valid at one atmosphere sea level. Okay, this becomes your uniform starting point for this stuff, all right? Well, when we take it up to Boeing Mountain, I don't know what the elevation is up there, okay? But it's gonna be higher than sea level, we know that. It's probably a thousand feet or something, all right? These readings, these, when that gas comes out of the tank, those molecules spread to a different distance. And that affects the way they're seen by the infrared. But all of a sudden, you don't have the same concentration that you did at sea level. Right? So the correction that we have to make <coughs> on this is we take, we, we monitor the barometric pressure. We compare it to sea level. Okay? We monitor it at that altitude. We do a calculation that uh, calculates the difference in between sea level <coughs> and the current barometric pressure and we apply that as a correction to the target value. There's two ways you can do it. You can either correct the reading or you can correct the target value. The more scientific way to do it is to correct the target value. Okay? So at a thousand feet variation this reading is going to change by something like 4% or 5% off the top of my head. <coughs> so the difference between a 0.08 at sea level and a 0.08 at 1,000 feet is going to be a, about 004. So what we'll say then on the test is that we'll say instead of saying the target value of the gas, if it was originally an 08, we're going to say a corrected target value of the gas is 0.06, and this is your actual reading. And it should be a 0.06 plus or minus 0.04. Does that answer your question on that? Or? So, if I'm doing a DMT up in White Mountain versus somewhere else, mm -hmm. East Lansing, obviously, those have to they're rather specific uh, adjustments or calibrations made for East Lansing versus Dearborn versus wherever well, else? Well, when, when the instrument is put in service, 
the technician will uh, will give the instrument a reference uh, a reference barometric pressure, and that's usually taken from the nearest uh, National Weather Service reporting site. So if they're sending these to East Lansing versus wherever else they're being deployed in, the, the tech from your company is, is setting this? So they'll know that this machine is going to East Lansing. Your tech when sets he it. To, when he gets to East Lansing, he gets the current barometric pressure set, or the current, sorry, the current station altitude. We're not talking about barometric pressure. Station altitude. He wants the altitude of the, of the police department. And That's we'll get that from the closest. Pardon? It's not actually taken from the police station. It's taken from the closest. Yeah, it's taken from the closest site. Unless he, for some reason, has an elevation in the police department. That would be nice. But normally they would take an airport elevation. And that's going to be close enough to, you know, so that you're not going to see any appreciable, any significant difference on that one. Just to go back to the example you said, a point oh eight at sea level and a point oh eight at a thousand feet higher than the sea level. Could you explain how the, uh, the, the what the correction factor is then? Okay. Uh, uh, one time. Basically, you're, you're just calculating the difference between the two elevations 